Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director here at the IOP. We're really excited to have everybody here. Uh, we're especially excited to have Governor Huckabee with us today, not just for this evening uh, for the forum, uh, but Governor Huckabee is a visiting fellow for us. He's going to be here several days, uh, immersing himself in Harvard's campus. He's already had a, a full day of activities and was planning some fun stuff ranging from tomorrow morning. He's doing morning prayers at Memorial Church at 845 in the morning. And I've even heard we may have arranged a jam session potentially awesome. uh, tomorrow night. Uh, he's uh, not just an amateur musician, a real musician. Uh, pretty so, amateur. Pretty amateur. <laughs> um, but anyway, let me give you a little bit of background about the governor. A lot of you know this uh, from watching him run for president in his post-presidential campaign life, maybe potential future campaign life. Um, but uh, he was first elected lieutenant governor of Arkansas in 1993. There was a special election. There may have been a guy who was, you've heard of, Bill Clinton, who was the governor of Arkansas. When he became president, that opened up the governor's office, so the lieutenant governor ascended to become the governor of Arkansas, opening up the lieutenant governor. So in 1993, uh, then Minister Mike Huckabee uh, ran for lieutenant governor and pulled off an amazing upset victory, uh, becoming one of the first Republicans to get elected statewide in Arkansas in a long, long time. And one of the very few, I think, three since the Civil War, yeah. essentially. Um, governor Jim Guy Tucker got in some trouble and resigned his position. And Governor Lieutenant Governor Huckabee became Governor Huckabee and then was elected to the full term uh, a little bit later and then re-elected, uh, becoming the third longest serving governor in Arkansas's history. Uh, in 2008, upon the conclusion of his time as governor, he ran for president, finishing second in the Republican nominating uh, race uh, to then nominee John McCain, who's gonna be here in the forum in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then after that, started a, a talk show, which a very successful talk show on Fox News, a radio show, uh, which recently wrapped up its run on Cumulus Media, syndicated all across the country. Interestingly enough, at the age of 14, it was his first job on the radio. He read news at that age, um, was very precocious. Also, for some of the folks at our school who have been involved in leadership programs, um, and this may have been foreshadowing, Governor Huckabee was also governor of Boys State uh, in Arkansas in high school and participated in the Hugh O'Brien Leadership Program which I know a lot of students here have participated in. Both of those programs are the girls' state equivalent. Um, so really glad to have you with us. And uh, we'll start off a little conversation, and then we'll bring all of you, uh, including the folks watching on the internet, both live and uh, on YouTube and later on on Archive. Uh, so welcome. So please join me in welcoming Governor Mike Huckabee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just start off by saying you, you started your career, professional career as a minister. Um, and we were successful at it. Uh, did a great did a great job with the two churches, growing them to large sizes. Had uh, were innovative with television shows and, mm -hmm. and networks and things like that. But you decided to run for office. You actually ran for senate first. Right. What made you make the plunge into politics? Well, you know, the pastorate was my second career. My first career was advertising and media, and I did radio, television, okay. and ran an advertising agency. And that was sort of a, a career path that I thought I was going to be on, and expected someday to run for office. And it's through a, a long, sort of unusual set of events that I ended up in the pastorate for 12 years. But it was an incredible experience, and it really was one of those moments where my detour became the destination. And it was, uh, it was like going to school for 12 years, uh, like going to school to learn how people mm -hmm. really live. Uh, because I can't think of any profession in the world in which a person can put a name and a face on every social pathology that exists. Because as a pastor, every single day, I would be talking to the people who didn't have enough food in their home. I talked to young couples who were struggling to keep their marriage together because of financial pressures. I talked to middle-aged couples whose kids were on drugs and they were having to decide whether to put them in rehab or let them go to, to jail. Uh, elderly people struggling with a, a diminished income and yet years of their life with no way to make all that work and, and literally choosing between food and, and medication. So I saw life at a level that I don't think anybody else perhaps sees it. And it really shaped a lot of my worldview and particularly my understanding of the real nature of problems that people faced. And so after 12 years of, of somewhat of an unconventional ministry, because I started television channels in both of the communities where I was serving as a pastor. Pine Bluff and Texarkana, right? Right. Yeah. And they were community challenges. We did all sorts of things that 
I mean, from airing high school football games to talk shows, because that was my background. I understood media better than I did a conventional and traditional mm -hmm. church life. And then it was, uh, it was during that time I became president of the Arkansas Baptist Convention, which is the denomination that was predominant in the mm -hmm. state. Um, and it was during that period of time that I started having people come to me and say, have you ever thought about running for office? Well, little did they know, that's what I thought about from the time I was much younger. But I just thought that that would never happen. And in large measure, because I came to the place where I didn't want to just be that guy that watched from the stands and always complained about the way the game was played, but never got out of the stands, got on the field, and got my jersey dirty. So it was sort of by process of saying, I can complain and gripe about what I think's wrong with America, or I can offer myself up and get out there and suit up and play the game. And so you decided to run for the United States Senate. And yeah, that didn't turn out to be such a yeah. great idea. But uh, so there's nothing wrong with losing a Senate race, you know. Yeah, I was, yeah, <laughs> yeah been there, been there, done that, huh? Yeah. Um, but you know, I picked a year in which Bill Clinton was running for the president, so it meant that every single registered Democratic voter in Arkansas went out to vote. Uh, and probably some that weren't even registered. I don't know, you know. <laughs> We've always said you gotta carry the cemetery vote in Arkansas to actually yeah. win. But I if you'd have taken the votes that I thought we needed to have to win, we had a, a good number of votes, but the voter turnout was off the charts that year because it was the first time that Arkansas had ever had to elect a president from its home state. So I understand that. But it, you know, as it turned out, it was providential because I think I would have hated the Senate. I truly do. I think I would have hated it. I don't have a legislative mindset. It's not something I understood then, but having served as a lieutenant governor and presiding over the Senate, and then having been a governor for ten and a half years, I came to realize there's a very different mind that one approaches the executive branch versus the legislative branch. And somebody who's really adept at one is very likely not adept at the other. Yeah, we hear stories of governors who go to the Senate and they hate it. Them for Haiti. Yeah. You know, like Mark Warner, I know one example. Yeah, Mark's of a, a good friend. An executive who became a governor. You all served at the, together. Right, we uh, did. And is now in the Senate and, uh, you know, wants to stay there, but it's not the same. Right, it's, it's not, not the, the same. same. So you lost that race, and then how did you convince your wife, Janet, who's here somewhere um, in the audience, is there in, in the back, the better half? Glad to have you here, too. Um, how did you convince her to go along with the race, right, you know, to run for lieutenant governor the next year? Um, well, that must have been a tough, an interesting conversation. Yeah, <laughs> but Trey, unlike a lot of people to run for office, I've never had to talk her into it. Uh, she's been there for me from, from the get-go. She always believed that I could do it, believed I should do it. Even when I chose not to run for president in 2012, a lot of people thought that I would. Frankly, there was a point at which I thought I would. Mm -hmm. um, I think the assumption was that maybe my family was not supportive and my wife wasn't in it. She was pretty unhappy with me for not doing it. And only later, at the end of the election, did she say, you know, I think you were right. Everything you said that would happen in the election did, and you were right not to do it. And we've been married 40 years next month, and I think that's like the first time she thought I was right. So that was good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was the first time for everything, right? The first time for everything. Yeah. So I've, I've commemorated that moment. Yeah. It's a great moment. Indeed. But so you, so you got elected. You told us this morning an interesting story about what happened when you got elected. You became yeah. lieutenant governor. And, and let's rewind it for everybody here. Arkansas, which is now becoming more Republican, back then was... Tell us how blue it was and what that meant for you well, uh, after your I win. was only the fourth Republican elected to a state office in 150 years, for one thing. No one had been elected to... A, an office as a Republican at the state level in uh, nearly 20 years. And the legislature, when I became governor in 1996, 89 out of 100 of the House seats were held by Democrats and 31 out of the 35 Senate seats were held by Democrats. So it was the most lopsided legislature in all the country, more than even Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, or any of the states that people tend to think as very, very blue. Um, so it was, uh, it was tough sledding you know, going into that environment when I was elected lieutenant governor in a special election of July 1993, got to the Capitol, ready to go into the office, lieutenant governor had held for as many years as anybody could remember, and the uh, then sitting secretary of state who oversaw the allocation of offices had my door nailed shut from the inside. <laughs> I mean, literally nailed shut. In fact, the Wall Street Journal sent a reporter down to uh, Little Rock because he'd heard the story and thought it was some exaggerated apocryphal Arkansas story and came down and sure enough found out that the nails were in the door, which they remained there for 59 days. So for my first 59 days in office, I worked out of a makeshift 
uh, cubby hole that was an old vault. All the furniture had been taken out of the office, all the equipment uh, pulled away. We didn't have computers, printers, anything. I was able to get a local office supply uh, an office furniture place to donate furniture so that we could use that. And it was quite the, uh, quite the welcome, yeah. to say the least. <laughs> I got the impression they weren't as excited about my being there as some other people yeah. were. So. Yeah, hopefully you're getting a warmer welcome here at, yes. at Harvard. Um, Nobody's nailed me to the floor. At least. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> it's only your first day. Yeah. Um, so you served in the position for a couple of years, then you became governor. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Guy Tucker got in trouble, um, ultimately served some time in prison, correct? Well, he would or have, but they gave him a house arrest okay. because of some health issues he had. Okay. And he was convicted and caught up in the whitewater-related okay. felonies. One of my college classmates, uh, Susan McDougall, was on trial mm -hmm. with, with uh, Jim Guy Tucker and her husband, Jim McDougall. And uh, it, it got pretty bad because there was a, a significant level of just corruption that was rampant in the state. We got to joking that the five most feared words of an Arkansas politician were these, Will the defendant please rise? Because <laughs> we had like 17 different legislators and our state officials, including that Secretary of State mm -hmm. that had nailed my door shut. He ended up doing uh, 10 years in prison mm -hmm. uh, for uh, stealing and corruption. Yeah. So they did not uh, unnail his door, by the way. <laughs> so, you, so you became governor, uh, obviously did well enough to get elected to your own term and then reelected. Right. Looking back, what's the, what's the top accomplishment? of your time as governor that you would point to? There, there are a lot of things that I could talk about governmentally and would be happy to. Yeah. But, but let me tell you what I really find to be when people say, what's the greatest thing you've ever yeah. accomplished? And, and honestly, and I know this sounds maybe trite, but it isn't, is that when I finished the entire experience of lieutenant governor and governor, um, that my kids, who I cherish a lot, did not reject everything I stood for. I, I see it happen a lot. A person gets into politics, and after a few years, their kids just hate every bit of it and they rebel against not only the role they are forced to play, but even the very ideology and the views. And I mean, it's just like a complete, just anger. And it was a real concern to me because- uh, and They were young when you got- Yeah, my, my oldest you were, son- You were pretty young when you were, you were one of the youngest governors in the country, right. I think. My, uh, my oldest son had just started college when I became governor. He was in high school when I became lieutenant governor. My uh, middle son was going into his junior year of high school, and my daughter was going into the ninth grade, which as all of you remember, has to be the worst time yeah. in a person's life. I mean, ninth yeah. grade is just awful. And, you know, we uprooted them from schools that they'd been in since they were in the first grade. Um, this whole pro it was tough on them, but they did okay. And I think I read an interview that someone had done with my daughter back during the presidential campaign, and somebody had asked her about the process of politics, how brutal was it? And she said, you know, it, it can be very tough, and people attack your father, and that hurts. You see them attacking you as a kid, and mm -hmm. you think, what did I do? But her perspective was, you know, yeah, we took some shots, but we got to see some pretty cool things, and we met people we never would have met. And so, all things considered, it was a, it was a great experience. And I, I think that's perhaps the thing for which I'm most mm -hmm. grateful. And when you were governor, you had, you, as you mentioned, you had to deal with a Democratic legislature, yeah. and you had to pass budgets and things like right. that. Um, how did, how, what was that like? And how did that, uh, obviously you couldn't get everything you wanted, so how did you, how did you guys, and, and as, I, as I recall, you said it's only a majority to overturn your vetoes. So yeah. it was kind of a, you yeah. had a weak bargaining position. Right, under Arkansas law, a simple majority can overturn a veto even if the supermajority is required to pass the vote. For hmm. example, 75 votes are necessary to pass a budget bill, but if I vetoed the bill, 51 votes would override the veto. So it was a very, very difficult kind of environment because the numbers were so overwhelming, and some of the Republicans weren't that solid either, to be honest with you. Um, I understood from the beginning that I wasn't gonna go in there and get everything I wanted. As it turned out, there was never a legislative session in which I got less than 90% of my legislative package passed. And when people say, how did you do that? Well, I think the, the art of governing is when you go into it understanding that if you don't have the numbers, then you better have the argument and you better bring people into the discussion. You can't just say, this is what I want to do, now join me or else. I didn't have that luxury. I couldn't even get my own party to snap in line. So, for example, if it was a road program, or if it was raising the education standards, or if it was the health initiative that we preceded SCHIP, by the way, with our Our Kids First program, whatever it might happen to be, I would find Democrats that I really believe were good guys, that given an opportunity to do something good for the state, would care more about the state 
than they would just poking my eye. And the thing that I feel so incredibly frustrated by as I watch Washington is that the, the atmosphere there being so polarized, it's like both sides have decided we want everything and we want it now. And if you, if you want everything and you want it now, you get nothing and you get it forever. Politics is ultimately the work of dealing with people and it's trying to understand what is it that, what is it you want? Mm -hmm. If you and I were negotiating, the first thing I'm gonna find out is what matters to Trey Grayson? What really is important to you? And if it's something that I can accommodate without violating my core values, then let me give it to you. Because now I have a reason to say, Trey, this was important to you, here's something important to me, I need to help you do it. Now I did something that was sometimes unpopular with some of my fellow Republicans. Let's say we had uh, a highway bill, which we did. We totally rehabilitated the entire highway system of our state. It was the worst highway system in the country according to Truckers Magazine. Uh, it, it was a disaster. It, it, you know, you drive from Little Rock to Memphis on Interstate 40. We used to joke that you could put a quart of milk beside you in the front seat of your car and it would have been turned into butter by the time you got to <laughs> Memphis because the road was so rough. So we did a $1 billion complete renovation of, of the highway system and it couldn't have happened had it not been from some, for some Democrats who believed that roads were a vital part of building an infrastructure that is critical to economic development. So when it was over, I would go to those guys' hometowns and I would get in front of their rotary club and I would say, I just wanna stand here today to tell you thank you for sending uh, Senator Portway because quite frankly, had it not been for his been, being here and working with me, we never would have gotten this done. It would have been very easy for him to say, I'm not gonna help that guy because he's a Republican, but he thought the state was more important than his own political party, and to his credit, he is vital in our having gotten this done. Now that might have rankled some folks in my party, but the fact is, you cannot move legislation forward if you think that you own it all unless you own it all. Uh, ultimately, politics is a mathematics issue. It's not about so much anything. If you can't get the 50 plus one, you lose. It's just that simple. So you've gotta be vote counting all the time. And the day that you can bring the votes to the floor, that's the day you bring the bill on the floor. And so you can do that, you don't. I found sometimes that it was just something as simple as, there was maybe a guy in rural Arkansas and he had a good friend in his district that had always wanted to be on the soybean promotion board. And I can see by your faces how exciting that would mm -hmm. be for some of you to be on the soybean promotion board. I know some folks in Kentucky would want to be on that board in Kentucky, it's mm -hmm. a big deal. But think about it, mean, if you're a soybean farmer, that might be something of great value. Right. So the, the legislator mm -hmm. would come and say, look, I got a guy who wants to be on the soybean board. Great, I can give that to you. Now, did I lose anything? Not really, because I didn't have anybody that was you know, jumping up and down to be on the soybean <laughs> board. But my point is, don't tell everybody no. Find out what you can say yes to. And the more things you can say yes to, the more things you'll find people saying yes to you. That's how you govern. And it's not necessarily easy. Uh, it means spending an enormous amount of time with people that don't typically like you, uh, but you never get them to work with you if you don't spend the time building relationships and finding out what, what matters to you, what, what's important to you, what do your children do, what's important to them. That's how you govern. Earlier you talked about how being a minister helped you as in politics. Um, one thing you didn't talk about was how church politics were probably the most uh, vicious or toughest type yeah. of politics. But I guess maybe stepping back a little bit, what role did faith play um, once you got to become the governor? Um, and when you're making some of those tough decisions, how did, uh, how did faith play a role in, in those decisions? You know, I always said that it, in many ways it made my job easier because I didn't have to wake up every morning and decide what I'm gonna believe today. You know, people could disagree with me, they could dislike it, I accepted that. I, I never had the illusion that everyone was gonna love me. Mm -hmm. So I, I understood that. But they would at least know where I stood, and if they didn't like me, at least they would know why. Mm -hmm. And they would know that I wasn't gonna change my view every time a new poll came out. So for me, it kinda made some things easier. I also tried to govern by a sense in which even if nobody knew why I did what I was doing, deep down I knew one day I would face mm -hmm. my creator who did know why I did yeah. what I did. And there were some tough decisions, and one in particular was uh, a case that was a death row case where um, you know, an absolute just loser had brutally murdered a man and was uh, on death row. He was scheduled for execution in two days. And um, it was my practice to read every single page of that person's court files, appellate court hearings, everything, 
uh, which was boxes and boxes of material, typically. And between that and a juror who came forward just, I think, three days before the execution was scheduled, who said that he had to open up and say that he was told that if a person pled guilty, there wouldn't be an execution, it would be life without uh, parole. And so my legal counsel brought this to me and said, I've got a juror that called us, and you know, what do we do? And I said, let's talk to him. So I did, and I realized he was telling the truth. Um, turned out two other jurors were willing, we started polling those, the jurors mm -hmm. that had been on there, and two others admitted the same thing. So I commuted the guy's sentence to life without uh, parole. It was an incredibly unpopular decision, especially in that man's hometown, because they, they loved that man. He was a good, decent, just hardworking man. His family was salt of the earth. And he was uh, you know, a delightful man who was savagely murdered in his home for 40 bucks. Um, nothing about that case was where you should say, oh, this guy ought to deserve a break. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, if the criminal justice system does not work for the guy who is the lowest among us, then it doesn't work for any of us. And I remember my legal counsel saying, you know, we're the only ones who know this story. And, you know, it, it, it's come in so late, and the courts haven't ruled this. And I said, you know, but I know. You know. So... It was a, a painful decision. I spent time with the family. They came to the governor's mansion. They wanted to talk to me. It was the worst afternoon of my life. I had two and a half hours of them just basically um, telling me exactly what I probably would have told them had the situation right. been reversed. I, I had nothing to say other than, I'm sorry I had to do this. I didn't expect them to understand. And no, they didn't. They never will, never should. I don't ex have any expectation of that. But those are the moments that you, you, know, you reach deep inside yourself and you say, there are some things that are bigger than the next election. Uh, if you gain the whole world and become president or governor, but you lose your soul in the process, then, then to what advantage? So that's, for me, that's where faith comes mm -hmm. in. You, you have some values that are bigger than just getting elected yeah. to something. So uh, you're, you finished being governor in 2006, 2007, and then you decided to run for president. What, why'd you run for president? I must have lost my mind. I don't know <laughs> what happened. Um, I'd been a, a governor probably, I think, longer than anyone serving at that particular time. I've been president or chairman of the National Governors Association. I chaired the Education Commission of the States and Southern Region Education Board, the Interstate Oil and Gas Commission. I've been involved with uh, and council serving of state as governments, council of state governments. Council of state governments, which I love that, by the yeah. way. It's a great organization, and I chaired that. I'd been involved in a number of intergovernmental uh, organizations, and I was very frustrated that at the federal level, government was dysfunctional. And I felt like that it, it didn't have to be dysfunctional and that there were a lot of things that, that could and should be done. And so um, I, I think there was this, a part of me that said, kind of like when I first got into politics, if you think you can do better, then go do it. So, uh, you know, I jumped out there in the, in the pool. I did find out that if you jump into the pool, it's helpful to have water in it. Uh, <laughs> wasn't much money for my campaign, but we really did get further along than I think most people would have ever imagined was possible because we operated on about a dime to the dollar of all my, my opponents in that race. And you, you won Iowa. Uh, you won, tell, tell, yeah. what, tell the audience what it was like to, to what's it like to campaign in Iowa? It's a, it's a lot like campaigning yeah. in Arkansas. It's retail politics, which I love. It's one-on-one. -on -one. You can't just buy television and own the top 500 feet of every radio and television tower and get your message on the airwaves. You have to go out and shake hands and talk to people. I love that. I think that's important. Uh, to the people who think Iowa and New Hampshire have a disproportionate share of uh, imp maybe impact in the elections of a president, I would say if you've run for the office, I think you'd come to appreciate that Iowa and New Hampshire do a very important job for the rest of America. They filter candidates. Sometimes they chew them up and spit them out, but in a good way. Because if you're going to run and try to win either of those states, you're going to talk to single moms who are barely making it. You're going to talk to some unemployed truck drivers. You're going to talk to people with serious health issues that can't afford the surgery they need. You're going to talk to every kind of person imaginable that if all you do is go to a big $10,000 a plate fundraiser, work the rope line, and disappear and run some ads, you'll never see those people. And I don't think anybody ought to sit in the Oval Office without having to have the absolute necessity 
of talking to the full gamut of the American public. And the good thing about it, when people say, well, what about other states? Let them do it. Here's the thing. Iowa and New Hampshire have done this so much that they're not starstruck because somebody's running for president. You go to some states, and just because you're a presidential candidate, people, oh, I want my picture made with you. Well, you're not that big a deal. In Iowa and New Hampshire, you're definitely not that big a deal. <laughs> uh, Lamar Alexander tells a great story. Um, he was sitting in a diner in New Hampshire, and um, he was going up to the people. He walked up to one lady. She was sitting there. This is back in the days when people could smoke in diners, and she was sitting there at the diner uh, counter smoking her cigarette. Lamar went up and introduced himself and said, uh, I'm Lamar Alexander. I'm running for president. And she looked up at him, blue smoke in his face, and said, yeah, we were just laughing about that a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a very humbling experience to run in states like that. Yeah. I think that's healthy, though, so that people don't get so full of themselves. Well, I want to ask um, maybe one more question before we invite the audience to come into this. Um, 2016, a lot of the polls show you're really, uh, you got a, a good shot in 2016. You're polling near the top in Iowa and New Hampshire and some of the national polls. Um, I'm not going to ask you if you're going to run or not. I mean, if you want to announce that today, that'd be great. I suspect yeah. you're a better politician than yeah. to announce your presidential campaign for the Republican nomination at Harvard today. Yes, I'm sure that would. But I'm okay if you want to do that. Right. But as you're making your mind up, you, talk, you alluded a little bit how you thought about 22, 2012 and yeah. made a decision not to, and it sort of played out the way you thought. What are you, what, what, what are you going to look at to make the decision for 2016? What are some of the criteria, some boxes you want to check? Uh, before making that decision? You know, I need to make sure that my family is 100%. My wife is fine, but, you know, I've got grown kids now. They have kids. So it's, it's a different world for them. You know, they're raising their families, and all of them are out on their own. I need to make sure that they're okay with that. Uh, it, it is, I can't begin to tell you what it's like, the pressure on a family. Uh, and unfortunately, it's gotten much worse, I think, because of the advent of the Internet, and so many people can take anonymous cheap shots at you without ever having to be accountable for the things they say. And you have to get where you can turn it off, but it's hard for sometimes your kids to hear that and, and to turn it off, especially stuff about them. But I think the other part, I just need to see that there would be a way, both politically and financially, a viable path to the nomination. And if I feel like that there is, um, you know, and I feel like that I have ideas that, that ought to be on the national stage, then, then I'll give it a shot. Maybe I'll ask one more question, and we'll do the okay. Q&A. What, what, you know, you have this reputation. You, you're, you're a social conservative. You're also this populist. I mean, you, you've mentioned several times yeah. a lot your concern for the downtrodden. Never, I think that's absolutely critical. Most Republican presidential hopefuls don't talk that way. Yeah. Um, well, it's who I am. Uh, yeah. You know, to put it this way, I, I've got a lot more in common with the people working in the kitchen than I do the ones sitting at the head table. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to learn how to sit at the head table. I didn't grow up that way. Uh, I'm one of those southern guys. You're from Kentucky. I'm from South mm -hmm. Arkansas. I'm, I'm a generation away from a mother who had a house where there was dirt floors and no electricity. No mail upstream from me, not my father, his father, his father, his father, far back as we can trace. No mail upstream from me ever graduated from high school, much less went to college. You know, I worked my rear off to go to college. I paid my own way, worked at a radio station 40 hours a week, and got through two years and three months, and it wasn't because I was smarter than everybody else, it was because I couldn't afford four years of that. So I figured, sitting down with a catalog, how is it reasonably possible to get through in a shorter period of time? But I appreciated my education because it cost me something. I grew up in a working class home where, you know, my father worked two jobs, my mother worked. We lived in a little rent house that's just a little shotgun house on Second Street in Hope, Arkansas. Uh, you know, we were poor, but so were a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. But it gave me, and to this day, I think a different sensitivity about how hard people have to work just to put food on their table and to be able to make it. So I'm not a person who is disconnected to the realities of what so many people in this country face every single day when they get up and work. And that's why, to me, it's ridiculous for someone to say, uh, I don't think we ought to have a, you know, a, a WIC program or we shouldn't have food stamps for some single mom uh, because, by golly, that's just, you know, bailing people out. Then I turn around and watch them bail out the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Are you kidding me? You know, no offense, but some of those guys, the smartest guys in the room, came from here. Mm -hmm. And if they're that smart and they ran their companies in the ground and they recklessly mismanaged their companies and lost millions of dollars for homeowners across the country and, and completely screwed the economy, why am I bailing them out? They ought to go to jail, not, you know, not to the bank, for gosh sake. And that whole disconnect to me has, has made me angry. 
that I don't begrudge us helping some single mom or a family that has a child with developmental disabilities. You know, th that's not, to me, a bailout. That's just being responsible citizens and neighbors. But I think it is irresponsible uh, not only to bail out these massive corporations, but then to turn around and allow them to walk away with bonuses of $100 million when they wreck their companies. That makes no sense to me. Well, I think uh, now's the time to bring the audience into the conversation. We've got microphones, two on the floor, uh, two in the boxes up the stairs. Um, for those who are uh, here at the forum for the first time, we have some rules in the forum. Uh, the um, Make sure you identify yourself and your affiliation if you have one with, with Harvard, uh, and make sure that your question <coughs> is not that long and ends in a question mark. And we'll start right over here in the Hi. front. Hi, Governor Huckabee. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, my name's Carolina Portela, and I am a freshman at the college. Um, and my question is in relation to your socially conservative views um, and how they tie into the business sector. So this weekend, um, Tony Perkins, the um, uh, head of the Family Research Council, was in your show, mm -hmm. and he called um, CEOs um, like that of Chico Filet cowards for retracting their views on um, marriage equality. And I wanted to ask, what is your take on Perkins' implication that corporate America is falling to economic terrorism of the left? I think there's a lot of bullying that goes on in America today toward people who don't follow a particular point of view. We saw it with uh, Brand Brendan Eich at uh, Mozilla. I thought the forced resignation that uh, was put upon him uh, was unfortunate. I mean, he gave a personal contribution of his money, not the company's money. He did it uh, six years ago. The position he took was identical to the position Barack Obama took in 2008, the position Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden took, and in fact, the position they all took until 2012 during the election year. So it's a little disingenuous to somehow say that his personal contribution should be met with the kind of uh, force that would force him out of his job. I found that quite disturbing as an American. In America, we should welcome more voices, not fewer. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, but we don't shut people down economically and try to put them out of their jobs because they disagree with us. That's bullying, it's economic terrorism. And so I was very troubled by that. I was troubled by the fact that apparently the pressure that was given to Dan Cathy at Chick-fil-A there was an article last week in USA Today where he said he apologized, wished he'd never taken a stand. I'm thinking, no, take the stand. I mean, you know, the, the fact is, people are buying your products, not your politics. And, and here's the example I use. I, I told a group earlier today, I'm kind of an Apple snob. Everything I have is Apple. Uh, <laughs> iPhone, iMac, MacBook Pro, Apple TV. I love Apple products. I know Tim Cook is one of the most outspoken advocates for same-sex marriage. Do I quit buying his products because his point of view disagrees with mine? No, because I'm not buying his politics, I'm buying his products. I order something from Amazon almost every day. Does Jeff Bezos share my opinion on things? No. What about Howard Schultz at Starbucks? Uh, I love Starbucks coffee. I continue to shop at Starbucks. I'm not gonna quit because Howard Schultz gives his money and even uses the platform of Starbucks to take positions that are antithetical to mine. I, I find that really scary that we would get in America a place where we start wanting to punish people economically. Uh, you're not going to see me leading boycotts of organizations and industries because somebody disagrees. The same thing is true. I'm a musician. I have enormous respect for people who are great artists who frankly would find my politics repulsive and would say horrible things about everything I stand for. But I still watch their movies or buy their music? Sure because I'm not buying their politics, I'm buying their art, and I can appreciate what they do, even if they have a point of view politically that's different from mine. Right, next question here in the box. Hi, yes, my name is Jacob Meisel. I'm a freshman here at the college. Thank you so much for being here again with us this evening. On uh, last Tuesday in Iowa, you stated that you were not homophobic, but rather, quote, on the right side of the Bible, mm -hmm. um, the same Bible that verbatim permits slavery and says adulterers and their wives should be killed. So my question is simply this. For those across America that don't classify as extremely religious, what makes something politically on the right side of the Bible versus the wrong side of the Bible? And can you give an analytical way of helping us to determine this? You know, when I say I'm not homophobic, I don't, uh, I don't have a particular hatred for anybody. In fact, this may really shock you, but my wife and I have entertained same-sex couples in our home uh, as house guests for a week. Uh, I know that would be a real shock probably to some of my conservative friends, but it's because 
I don't judge individuals who disagree with me as somehow unfit for my friendship, and I value their friendship. They understand that I don't particularly agree with same-sex marriage, but they know that I love them as human beings, as friends, and as, as equals in terms of uh, who they are. Uh, you know, I, I go back to the point, I find it interesting that people are so very offended by a position that I take, which is identical to the Barack Obama position, and I want to just point out that when he said in 2008 that he didn't support same-sex marriage, the reasons he said he didn't was because, A, he was a Christian, and two, because he said he didn't believe the Bible uh, taught that. Now, my question would be, best I can determine, you can tell me if you can come up with a fourth possibility, one of three things. Either he wasn't telling the truth about his position then, he's not telling the truth about his position now, or the Bible was revised, edited, and rewritten somewhere between <laughs> 2008 and 2012, and guys like me didn't get the memo. So you tell me what's the fourth option. If you believe something to be true, and you, you state that it's true because of a biblical worldview, then that worldview probably isn't going to change. It's not a surprise. It shouldn't be a shock. It doesn't mean that we have uh, you know, some type of fire and brimstone and anger toward anybody. I, I think you've seen me tell you tonight, that's not who I am. And it's why that uh, you know, I've not shut the doors of my own home to people uh, who are gay. Why would I? I don't think like that. Thank you. Up here in the next box, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger and I'm a, a Harvard alum. Uh, you've been rather um, courageous and outspoken uh, about your challenges with weight loss. Um, yeah. And a lot of Americans are battling with weight loss, um, and there's politicians like Chris Christie and others that have challenges uh, with their weight. Um, can you comment a little bit about what is your experience has been when you've been on the campaign trail and just meeting with folks and, and interacting with the media with regard to weight loss? Uh, how, how fair has have people been, and what, what have those experiences been like um, as you've been dealing with Well, it's very with difficult to maintain uh, any type of semblance of healthy behavior on a campaign yeah. trail. Uh, for one reason, and of course Trey's been there as mm -hmm. well, uh, everywhere you go someone hands you something to eat. An ice cream cone in Iowa, it's like a pork chop on a stick. Yeah. It's like the, almost the whole pig on the stick. You all have those just, cake auctions in Arkansas? Where you oh to, like, gosh, you well, had to, like, pie, yeah, pie the pie auctions. Yeah, and, the pie auctions. Yeah. yeah, and you gotta go and buy pies yeah, and then you, you have yeah. to eat it. And it's always like, here, try mine. And yeah. you know, you <laughs> really have to really work hard to tell people that looks delicious, but I'm just full. I don't think I could have another bite. Deep down, you're saying, man, I'd like to eat the whole pie. <laughs> um, it, it's a challenge, but I think the bigger picture, I don't want the, you know, the government telling us what we can and can't eat, but I do think that there is a vested interest in promoting healthy behavior. But it's a cultural issue. It's not so much uh, a specific law that we pass. And I've seen, let me give an example of four cultural changes that I've seen in my lifetime. And I think this is how you best handle the health culture. Um, one of them is litter. In the early 60s, litter, you, you can't imagine this, but you drive down the highways and it was just, it looked like the streets of New York on a Saturday morning where there's just trash everywhere. And Lady Bird Johnson came along and said, we need to beautify America. Um, and we did. It was a whole measure of things, including this very memorable television ad that you may have seen if you've ever taken courses. In, advertising where there was a Native American and he's weeping and, and he's looking at all the trash and pollution in the water and he just weeps and you know I, as a little kid, I was a kid during that time, I looked at him and said I don't want to make him cry, <laughs> you know, so let's not throw our trash down. So there was a whole cultural change that happened. A second one was seat belts. Mm -hmm. Seat belts were an aftermarket device in cars until 1967 and even after they were forced to be put in cars, nobody wore them. I mean, they just didn't. Uh, it was like, if you'd have gone in my hometown in the early 60s and, and taken a seatbelt to the mechanic and said, hey, I'd like to put a seatbelt in the car, he looked at me and said, you won't do what? <laughs> you want to put a strap in your car to tie you in while you're driving. <laughs> They'd have thought you were nuts. You'd have been the talk of the town. But once we saw the crash dummy videos, mm -hmm. we started thinking, maybe a seatbelt's not a bad idea. Uh, I know this is going to be crazy, but smoking mm -hmm. was a very different cultural event in the, uh, even into the, up to the late 70s. If we had had this meeting in 1973, half this room would have lit up cigarettes while we sat here and talked. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, if you'd been at an American Medical Association meeting with doctors, half the doctors in the room would have sat around tables smoking cigarettes talking about 
the health problems of America. It was just, I mean, it's bizarre as I go back and think about it. It's not that long ago. Um, we had a cultural change. Drunk driving, it used to be that was the, the part of comedy. I mean, Foster Brooks and Dean Martin always laughing about being drunk. And, you know, then the Mothers Against Drunk Driving told us it's really not very funny. There's nothing funny about people driving drunk. And a lot of people get killed, innocent people. Now, the, the short of this is that all four of those things represent huge cultural changes that if you're a student here now, probably it's hard to relate to because you've only lived in a world where there were seat belts in cars, we had litter baskets out and you didn't just throw trash. Uh, people don't smoke in intimate closed in places and um, you know, drunk driving isn't funny. But if you're my age, you remember when it wasn't like that. What I'm saying is that I think that there is a, a way in which we move the culture. And if you look in all of those things, I'll be very quick here, but there was at least three stages. One was the awareness and advertising phase where we just informed people and made them think. The second was uh, the alternative phase where we gave them something else, like put a litter basket out and tell them this is where it goes. And ultimately action. The government takes action once the cultural norm has been shifted, not before. The government, if, if the government tries to shift the cultural norm and force it, people will rebel against it because in America people value their liberty. They value their ability to make their own decisions and they resent if the government says, you cannot, you will not. If, however, it becomes a new cultural norm because we've changed the conditioning and the thought, then people are willing to accept. I signed uh, an, uh, you know, an indoor clean air act in Arkansas as a governor that banned smoking in every workplace indoors in my state. If I'd attempted to do that even five years before, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be sitting here. I would have been lit up like a cigarette, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> on the Capitol steps. But you have to wait for, the, for that right moment. That's how I think it happens. Down here on the floor. Governor, thanks so much for being here. My name is Matt Stolhansky. I'm from Texas, and I'm a senior fellow uh, here at the Kennedy School. Um, I, there was a moment in the 2004 primary um, in which uh, I was watching as a very young evangelical Republican, uh, and I think there was a moment when you took all of our breath away. Um, you sort of crystallized the thinking, of, you gave a, an amazing biblical exegesis of the intrinsic value of human life from the moment of conception. Mm. And literally the rest of the candidates on the stage sort of lost their breath, and someone else was asked about it and said, I can't do better than that, right? That so infrequently happens. And I think I then found myself in the seminary and uh, began asking some critical questions about faith, and now looking back on that, have to ask the question, um, to what extent did the value to me of that statement and crystallization as a, as a young evangelical Republican um, have more value than per perchance the disenfranchisement that it caused to Muslims amongst us, or mm -hmm. to women who totally disagreed or didn't understand the perspective that you were sharing? And so I, I guess my question is twofold. The first piece is from the Christian perspective. How do we begin to have a better apologetic as a, as a faith community than love the sinner, hate the sin, which is obviously driving away homosexuals in droves from our churches? And as a party, how do we begin to craft a narrative that's more inclusive of people of color, of immigrants, of the poor, um, of all of the types of people from whom we hear nothing but xenophobic and homophobic and mm -hmm. misogynist rhetoric coming out of a lot of our Republican election officials? Well, first of all, it's a real delight to meet a true minority, and that's an evangelical Republican on the Harvard campus. That's a, uh, We found one. Yeah. yeah. Every, every school ought to have at least one, and I yeah. guess you're Harvard's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a, a gay evangelical Republican. Oh, we definitely found one. Yeah. You know, for me, the, the sanctity of life issue is not about abortion. I think, unfortunately, it's become a battle about that. It's not. It's a human rights issue. It's whether or not we value every life as having intrinsic worth and value. Do we believe that there's such a thing as a person who's expendable? Do we believe there's such a thing as a person who's disposable? And so it's not about, do we wanna make a decision for a woman? It's, cause it's not. Uh, I value life, not only life in the womb, I think that's you know, a precious life, but I value life once it comes out of the womb. As a pro-life person, I can't limit my appreciation and uh, commitment to life only as long as it's in the gestation period. The eight month, uh, you know, unborn child that's still in the mother's womb is valuable. But so is the eight-year-old living under a bridge. Uh, so is the 80-year-old in a long-term care center. There's no such thing as a life that's not worth living. Uh, I, I, you know, when I ask people, can you point anyone in the room here that you think we could do without, other than me? Huh, maybe you could think it. <laughs> um, 
I mean, most of us would never go there. We would never, ever go there and say, oh, yeah, I think there's some people that we should just get rid of. Because we, we don't think like that. Um, you know, sad to say, I think we've made this an issue about politics when it ought to be far bigger than that. It really ought to be whether we believe that there is worth and value in every single human life. Uh, there are lives that they're, they're not the same, but they're equal. Equality and sameness are two different things. And equality doesn't mean of the same capacity and same abilities. There may be a person who's born with Down syndrome. Is that person worth less than the captain of the football team? Not to me. I can't imagine that I would ever come to the place and say, well, that person's really not very valuable. We should have gotten rid of him while we had the chance. That's a horrible thing to think, and I don't think anybody here would say that or think that. Um, so it comes down to the bigger issue of valuing human life at every level. And I think those of us who are pro-life, we have to be very consistent, and we have to be honest and say, we can't just stop loving people once they're born and then say, ah, oh, congratulations, you're born, now you're on your own. That's a message that, that I think our party uh, has to be very, very clear about, is that there's not a time at which we um, you know, think human beings have lost their value. Back over the microphone here. Right. Thank you, uh, Governor, for coming uh, today. Uh, I'm Jose Sanchez, and I'm an immigration attorney from Texas, East Texas, so I've been to Arkansas numerous times, and I'm a student here at Kennedy School. I know during your governorship there was a, an increase of uh, Mexican workers in Arkansas, mm -hmm. uh, with chicken plants and farms, and in fact, I believe there was a consulate built in Little Rock during your governorship. So I know you have a lot of history of being very, uh, back to what you're talking about, humankind, to respect the immigrants, and in fact, uh, you were very pro-Bush on his immigration uh, plan in 06, but then when you ran for president, you kind of got more, more against that. So my question is, what is your current uh, opinion about immigration reform, and also what do you think the Republican Party is going to have to do to get more Latino votes the next time? Yeah, my view has really never changed, and it's that I think we have to have control of our borders. I think it's ridiculous to think that uh, we wouldn't. My goodness, everywhere I go in the world, there's control of the border, and people expect me to be able to present documentation to get into a European country or anywhere else, and I'm okay with that. Um, a lot of the problems we have with illegal immigration is expired visas. People, when they got here, they came here legally, but then they, uh, they just stayed, and they overstayed their visas. I think that's problematic, and uh, I blame the government for not doing a better job of of policing their own permits. When I say border security, the pur purpose of border security is not to keep people out holistically, but it's to make sure that the people who do come in have a valid reason for coming. They're not coming to sell drugs, they're not coming to escape criminal prosecution, they're not coming to engage in criminal activity, they're not bringing a communicable disease. Those are legitimate things that I think my government has a responsibility to do uh, to, to pr protect the rest of us. But when I was governor, there were many steps I took that some of which turned out to be quite controversial. For example, I supported the idea that if a, a child um, grew up in a family that was illegal, that that person who had been in our public schools for his or her entire life should be considered a state resident to go to college, should be eligible for every scholarship. Uh, some people thought that was horrible. I thought, well, look, by law, we made these kids go to school they didn't do anything wrong. You know, you say, well, they're illegals. Their parents made the decision to come here. When a kid's four years old, he doesn't make a decision and say, Dad, I'm taking the family across <laughs> the border. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Why are, wh you, we never punish children for what their parents do. I mean, that, it'd be like the policeman stopping a car that's speeding, and instead of pulling the father out from behind the steering wheel and giving him a ticket, he goes to the back seat and takes the six-year-old and says, you were in this car, it was speeding, you're guilty. That's nonsense, we don't think like that. And so it was a controversial position, but I, I felt it was the right thing to do and still do. Um, we provided prenatal care regardless of a person's status. Now part of it was because I'm pro-life and I said, you know, I don't care if the life is illegal or not, it's a life, it's valuable. I, I don't believe that we can somehow b believe that it's less important because that baby's in the womb of a mother who's here illegally. So we did prenatal care through our Medicaid program. Part of my reasoning was maybe compassion. Part of it was economic. If you provide prenatal care to, uh, to a mom, 
um, and that mom has good care and has a normal delivery versus if she spends one night in the neonatal unit at Arkansas Children's Hospital, it will be more expensive than 100 prenatal care um, births for those mothers who had good medical help prior to the birth. So it just made sense economically. I think our immigration policy has to be realistic. One, get control of the borders. I think that's, that's the beginning point. Um, there shouldn't be a blanket amnesty. That's, that's unfair to the people who went through the process legally. They took all the steps. They waited, and they waited through all the paperwork. Um, but the process of coming here legally should be much simpler than it has become. And it shouldn't be that it's easier to try to break through illegally than it would be to do the necessary steps to be legal. I don't think we're going to see anything happen this year. Um, and frankly, I think the only way we'll see immigration reform, quite frankly, is when, and I'm not saying this from a partisan standpoint, from a pragmatic standpoint, when the House and the Senate are Republican and a Republican president is in office, then you have the best opportunity for, for genuine immigration reform because it won't get caught up in um, the real harsh environment of, uh, of Washington polarized politics. Thank you. Uh, question up there in that box. Yeah. Um, thank you, Governor uh, Hukabi, for being here. Thank you. My name is uh, Ayub Edera. I'm uh, a lawyer and an HKS student, mid-career student. I have a question about your controversial saying about Islam and Muslims. You said a couple of, uh, a few years ago, you compared Muslims to uncorked animal, like for violent behavior during their holy, the holy months or their holy days. And you said that Christians would not throw eggs during Easter, but Muslims, they throw stones and you know, they, they're being violent during Ramadan and or Friday. Personally, I'm Muslim. I've never thrown stones, either on Friday or on the other days. So uh, do you really think there is a link between Islam and violence, knowing that in the history of other religions, Christianity included, you know, there is a whole history of violence. So can you please precise your saying about this? Thank you. Yeah, I was reacting, if it's what I think you're referring to, to a specific instance. Um, I think it was probably in Israel when there was uh, a, a violent episode as people were coming out of, um, of the mosque uh, on, the, on the day of prayer. And my comment, I don't remember the exact words because it's been a while ago, and I've said a lot of things, but I don't remember all the details. But it was, it was to the effect that... Um, when people go to prayer, they, it seems inconceivable to me that they would come out of a place of prayer and engage in violence. And that's not a slam on every Muslim across the world, good heavens no. But it certainly was, for me, uh, an observation of those particular Muslims coming out of that particular mosque who left what should be a place of peace, a place of prayer, a place of commune with God, and came out and engaged in violent behavior. I would say the same thing if Christians came out of their church. I have said the same thing about Christians in the South who in the 1950s and 60s uh, were racist and whose activities were unfathomable, unbiblical, immoral, evil. I've said that. So it's not something that I've uniquely applied only to, to Muslims. I apply to anybody who would take their faith and use it as a platform uh, for violence and for injuring other people. Back down here on the floor. Uh, my name is Michael Skoke. I'm on staff at Harvard, sorry, staff at Harvard Business School. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the state of the Republican Party and uh, where you see things going in 2016. Do you, do you think it's going to be more of an establishment candidate or are we going to have somebody more like, you know, Rand Paul or somebody who's uh, more libertarian perhaps? I think it's wide open. I think it could be anywhere on the spectrum. Uh, because the Republican Party in many ways is trying to sort of decide what it wants to be when it grows up. Uh, this is not new. It's not new to the Republicans. It's not new to the Democrats. I remember when the Democrats were struggling to find a presidential candidate that they could get elected after uh, the end of Jimmy Carter, eight years of Ronald Reagan, four years of George Bush, 41. And there was real angst about someone like Bill Clinton because he was really more of a centrist. He was not in the George McGovern mold of, um, 
of Democratic presidential candidates, not of the Walter Mondale mode. He was a practical Southern governor who, who really had a very different approach. Um, people called it the third way. I remember that term. And he was able to be elected, even though he was anathema to many Democrat stalwarts at that time. And now he's the greatest hero. You know, the Democrats, the Democrats treat him like Republicans treat Ronald Reagan. Let's not forget that Ronald Reagan was a pariah in the Republican Party. He was hated by the establishment. They couldn't stand him. They thought, oh gosh, this actor, are you kidding? Well, this man would be an embarrassment to be president. Why, he's not fit for the job. And this was the Republicans talking about him. <laughs> and so they assumed that the real candidates were George Bush, who later became president, um, Howard Baker, um, John Connolly. I mean, there were all these people that were all considered to be legitimate candidates, not Ronald Reagan. Now mention Ronald Reagan's name in a Republican setting and, you know, people start weeping and they put their hand over their heart. <laughs> I'm not sure Ronald Reagan could get elected in today's environment because he uh, changed his view on abortion. He uh, spoke openly about his faith. He was unapologetically pro-life. He, um, you know, he compromised on things like taxes and raised some. He cut a lot of them, but he raised some taxes. He worked with Democrats. I mean, he did some things that to many Republicans, well, you just can't do that. But it was because he was who he was. And I don't think people loved Ronald Reagan so much because of all of his specific policies, but they knew there was something about him that he loved America and he could articulate that. And he could articulate a message of hope and optimism, which I think is more important than checking off a hundred boxes. Uh, th there's a few, what I call the political hard types that, you know, they're all about, are you very on this issue, this issue, this issue. Folks, those are not the people that decide elections. Hate to break this to you, but the elections are not decided from the far left or the far right. They aren't. The people on the far left, the people on the far right, they're going to vote the way they're going to vote. Nothing's going to change that. The elections are decided by that people, uh, group of people in the middle who could lean left, lean right. Uh, they're what I call, and I have a philosophy of governing, and, and it's this, is that there's horizontal government, which is what the practitioners of government uh, play. If you're a practitioner, most of you in this room, you're at the Institute of Politics, you're at the Kennedy School, because either you are or you want to be a practitioner of, of some type of public service or government. Chances are you tend to think horizontally. You think liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, left, right. That's fine. You go to the single mom who's standing there pumping gas and figuring out how much she can put in her car right now. She doesn't care if things are left or right or liberal or conservative. She wants to know her thing's going to be up or down. She's not a horizontal voter. She's a vertical voter. Because for her, the issue is not horizontal. It's vertical. Are you going to make my life better? Are you going to make it worse? Will you make our country better? Are you going to make it worse? And I'm convinced that the Republicans need to present the vertical message, not the horizontal. I never would have been elected in Arkansas had I been a horizontal candidate. If I'd have gone to the little towns that had never voted for a Republican in their history, and that was most of them, and said, I brought an elephant to town. Please jump on the elephant, ride down Main Street with me. I mean, that was tantamount to just getting creamed. I, I did. I would go into restaurants and people wouldn't shake my hand because I was a Republican. I know that sounds hard to believe, but it was that kind of animosity. So if I had run as, quote, the horizontal candidate, I would have never been elected. I was honest and I wasn't disingenuous about who I was. But I always presented the message in a vertical manner, not a horizontal manner, which I think is the key for Republicans, or for that matter, I think for Democrats. I think it's why Bill Clinton was so effective. Bill Clinton did not run as a horizontal candidate. He ran as a vertical candidate. Back over to this microphone. Uh, BES, uh, IOP, and Sigma 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 on 2008. Uh, my name is J. Mark Inman. I'm also a candidate running for U.S. Senate right at the moment. Uh, I was wondering, I heard that I hope you your experience is better than mine. Uh, I hope so as well. It's a bit of a challenge, I, I'm sure you know. Um, I was wondering, I heard that you uh, play a mean bass. And I was also on the X Factor in 2011. I sing. So I was wondering if you would love to jam at some point. Absolutely, yeah. Great. No, I love to play music. Music was life changing for me. And I'll, I'll tell you this little story because I certainly would never have run for office, been elected, wouldn't have had a life probably at all. Um, I'm one of those kids that sort of came of musical awareness when the Beatles came.
came to the U.S. in February of 1964. And I think that moment was magical for so many people of my generation. And at that moment, I said, I'm going to be the fifth Beatle, you know? <laughs> Why not? Uh, that didn't work out, but I, I wanted to play music, so I started begging my parents to buy me an electric guitar. I was eight years old, and, you know, they said, well, we can't afford a, a guitar. And they couldn't, but I didn't know that, and I didn't care that they couldn't afford it because I wanted one. <laughs> and so for three consecutive years in a row, for Christmas, I would ask for electric guitar. And they would always say, well, I don't know if we can do that. What else would you like? And they made me put something else on the list, and I would, and I would always get to something else. So when I was 11, in uh, December of 1966, I put one thing on my list. I said, I want an electric guitar. And they said, well, if we can't afford that. And I said, then I don't want anything. And I came this close later than I find out that I wasn't going to get a thing. <laughs> but what my parents did, they... Uh, ordered a guitar from the J.C. Penney catalog, the whole rig, amplifier, $99. That may not seem like a lot of money, it was an enormous amount of money for my parents. And it took them a year to pay for it. They paid a little bit every month for a year until they got it all paid off. But they got that guitar for me when I was 11 years old. It changed my life. Uh, because I was a very shy and bashful kid, didn't like to be in front of people. But when you play a musical instrument, at some point, you want to play and you want to play in front of people, and you want their approval. And so playing that guitar was a turning point for me. And it gave me a sense of confidence. I learned how to learn, because music is a great way to, to learn the process of learning. And to this day, I'm a very passionate person believing that music and the arts are such an incredibly important part of the education process I was one of the only governors in America that pushed for and got passed and signed legislation that required music and art programs for every student K through 12 with certified teachers. And I had a lot of pushback, people saying, well, we're a poor state, we can't afford that. I said, no, you can't afford not to have it. Because there are a lot of right brain dominant kids in our schools that don't fit into the mold of the sit down, put your feet in front of you, stand up, sit up straight, listen to me talk for 45 minutes. I was one of them. Well, you're one of, okay, so you get it, you understand. And those are the kids who, frankly, are going to be the CEOs of the company someday. They're the creative types. The right brain dominant creative types will run the companies. The left brain kids are well behaved, but they're going to be compliant. But it's that non compliant right brain kid that'll think differently than anyone's ever thought. My point of that is that why shouldn't we touch the talent of every kid in our school? It's, it's a wrong thing. A third of our kids drop out of school, and they're not dropping out because they're dumb, they're dropping out because they're bored. But if we touch their talent, whether it's acting or painting or dancing or playing music, uh, that's how you keep a kid in school. You give him something that lights his fire. So I'm very passionate about music and the arts programs in our schools, and I think it's uh, an absolute essential part of an education. I've told people it's not extraneous, expendable, or extracurricular. It is absolutely essential. Thank you. I'll talk to Trey after. Thank okay, you. we'll play. All right. Over yes. here. Good afternoon, Governor Huckabee. Thank you very much for your time this evening. My name is Margaret Irving, and I'm a freshman at the college. And you spoke about how politics is really a numbers game and the importance of getting that last vote and finding out what people want. And I was hoping you could just speak a little bit more about uh, the negatives of having to do so and how frustrating it can be at times. To run for office? Or no, sorry, of, of getting that last vote, of finding out what people want to make the numbers balance. Oh, um, you mean in a legislative process? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you go into it thinking you have it all lined up and then it, it blows up in your face because of just the petty political process. I always said that in, in, uh, in legislative atmospheres, there are the players and there are the towel poppers. The players are the ones who, when they leave the locker room, they're going out to play the game and they're going out to win. Then there are the people who know they'll never be a starter, they're never really going to be effective, they get elected, and frankly, just to be a big deal walking around the state capitol. And I call them towel poppers. They're quite content staying in the locker room, popping towels and playing games and hijinks. And they're never serious about changing the state. And you know, when, when, they, when, when they have enough influence, you lose. And there were times we lost pieces of legislation. The biggest one I ever lost was a government reorganization plan. We, had, uh, we passed it through the Senate. We had the votes on the House floor, but we couldn't get it through the Government Affairs Committee in the House because uh, there was a 12-member committee, and we couldn't get the seventh vote. And the sad thing was, if we'd gone to the floor, it would have passed. 
but there, was some, there were some towel poppers, and they kept it from ever getting out of the committee, and it was very frustrating. We demonstrated how it would make state government more efficient. We'd save millions of dollars. We'd stop the duplication of a lot of our administrative services, because if every agency has legal and HR and all, you're duplicating things that could be consolidated on the economy of scale. It just makes sense. It's what every business would do. And we couldn't get it passed because there were people protecting the constituencies of, of some government agency, and it was unfortunate. It's frustrating, but you know, you, you never can get bitter. And the one thing that I believe very strongly, a guy that will mess you up today may be your ally tomorrow, so don't burn the bridge with him. You might be mad, but say it privately. Don't take him on in the papers because it's not going to do any good. You're not going to make him come around by challenging him publicly. Um, and, and, you know, maybe live to fight another day. This will be our last question here. Good evening, Governor. My name is Alan Fitzmaurice. I'm just a guy who came over here after work to hear you speak. I applaud your uh, ability to discuss differences in a civil manner. However, I can't get my head around that on one hand you can say that you and your wife entertain same sub same sex couples at your home and mm -hmm. consider them friends. However, you would use your position to deny them basic civil rights. My, and if we could leave the Bible out of the equation for a minute, you're a man of God, you believe the Bible, and I respect your uh, decision to lead your life that way. I consider it just a book of nice stories. My question is, are you willing to come halfway up the road and embrace civil unions? Well, civil union is a very different thing. And, uh, you know, it, when the first discussion of rights began to be discussed, it was want to be able to go to the hospital to see my partner, want to be able to, um, you know, have the power of attorney. I've got no problem with, with having people, uh, whether it's a consensual cohabitation, but marriage to me is, is a sacred institution. It's different. Now, it isn't everybody. Would marriage? What's that? I mean, would you embrace civil unions with all the benefits of marriage without the word marriage? You know, I, I don't have a big problem. I'd have to think through how that would be applied. Here's the one thing I don't want to have, though, is where we dismiss the concept of what marriage means. I think that's important. S frankly, far more than I'm passionate about same-sex marriage. I know people think that that's all I think about. It really isn't. I rarely ever think about it. I really don't. Uh, people ask me all the time. I'm more worried about the heterosexual marriages that are falling apart at more than 50 percent because that means that a lot of kids are growing up in single-parent homes far more likely to get into juvenile delinquency, drug addiction, alcohol. I mean, the statistics are there. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, back in the early 60s when he was working as a young Labor Department attorney, talked about, uh, you know, the, the, the whole issue of, of uh, unwed mothers having children and what that was doing culturally. And the numbers that he was dealing with were minuscule compared to what we're dealing with today. So if we really are serious about dealing with poverty, we need to make sure that we encourage strong, stable families that, you know, that hold together. It's not easy. I mean, Janet and I celebrate 40 years next month. Uh, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, we're not better than somebody else. It's just that we never saw a divorce as an option. We certainly had our share of challenges. But I really am more burdened about the complete breakdown of the heterosexual marriages than I am simply the presence of, of same-sex marriage. Although, you know, again, I go back to my position being that of Barack Obama in 2008. I want somebody to ask him those questions. The president has done more for gay rights than any other president in history. So to use his position that he has changed mm -hmm. as a defense, but why I find kind change? of insulting and weak. Yeah, but why did he change it? That's the question. If he said that it was because, that he opposed it because of the biblical Christian perspective he had, and then he changed it, I just want to know, was he dishonest then, dishonest now, or did the Bible get changed? I, I think that's irrelevant. I think it's very relevant, but I appreciate your position. I disagree. Well, Thanks. I Absolutely. Well, and the good thing is we did it agreeably, which is very important. So, so I want to thank all the audience for coming out tonight. Um, <laughs> here in Governor Huckabee. Um, tomorrow night, Lisa Monaco from the uh, Obama administration will be here in the forum. Next week, uh, Senator John McCain, the 2008 Republican nominee, will be in the forum. The lottery is still open for that, correct? Yes? Yes? Go online? Yes. And then on Friday, uh, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, who was mentioned earlier this evening, uh, there's lotteries open for that as well in the forum. So we're getting a little preview, a little, some Republican presidential timber 
uh, yeah. here in the forum in the month of April. So, and finally, join me in thanking Governor Huckabee for a wonderful Thank you. Day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Trey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.